Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hopefully, we are now going live on Facebook. I'm Julie Flygar, and I am the president and CEO of Project Sleep, and I am broadcasting here from Los Angeles. And we have a very special guest with us tonight, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi. And where are you? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Okay. And um, so uh, what is the temperature like in Pittsburgh? Very cold. It's probably about 16 degrees right now. Wow. Lots of snow, but it was sunny today. So that's a good thing. Sounds nice. Uh, I mean, kind of sunny sounds nice. <laughs> the um, sun's nice. <laughs> yes. I hope everybody is staying warm uh, wherever you are and um, safe uh, for our friends in Texas and um, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, please take good care of yourselves or come out to visit me in LA. Well, I guess you can't really do that, but it's uh, 73 here and sunny, uh, so I feel very lucky. Um, and so please, as you join tonight, please share where you are tuning in from. It's uh, really fun to see all the different locations, uh, different continents uh, that people are tuning in from. And uh, Brooke won't be able to see probably during the uh, live, but afterwards she'll love to check after and see what you guys are, you know, what resonated with you. So please definitely share in the comments and share the broadcast uh, at any time. I think there should be a button to share it onto your page so that can help it reach more people. Give her lots of hearts, lots of likes, all those things. Um, all that engagement really helps Facebook know that you're enjoying this and that maybe other people might enjoy it too. So um, before Brooke gets started though, I'm just gonna share a few Project Sleep updates. We haven't had one of these in a few weeks. So uh, I think this is our first in February. So since we last saw you guys, we've launched the Sleep In uh, for uh, the week uh, weekend of March 12th through the 14th. So thank you for those that have signed up to participate in our seventh annual Sleep In. Uh, and it's one weekend where we're focused on rest and, and relaxation and sleep. And we have live broadcasts throughout the weekend uh, and different ways for people to engage. So we're really excited about the sleep in. And um, yeah, it's really exciting to see all the people that have already signed up and started fundraising and sharing all the different graphics. And we'll have some new gifts coming out soon by Elle, our graphic designer uh, in Australia. She's working on some new sleep in gifts. So we're really excited about those. Um, we launched the Rising Voices application. So if you enjoy Brooke's presentation tonight and you haven't uh, been part of the Rising Voices program yet, this is your chance to apply and applications are due by April 15th. And then the training is happening over the summer. Uh, I believe it's June 15th through July 20th. So it's about five weeks and um, you work on building a presentation just like Brooke is gonna deliver tonight. Um, please stay tuned in the coming weeks for a big advocacy action. We're really excited to do our annual letter project uh, where we get members of the House of Representatives signed on to an important letter uh, that is promoting the priorities of the sleep community. Uh, and so please stay tuned for that. Save some extra spoons, just get ready. We don't have it yet, but it's coming. And hmm, I'm probably forgetting something. I know we, we do have the scholarship application open for students that are high school seniors. Uh, starting college next year with narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, that scholarship opportunity is now open. And I think that's it. So um, one more note before Brooke starts. <laughs> uh, please remember that we're doing this for educational purposes and that, uh, you know, if anything about Brooke's story uh, gives you any questions about your own medical situation or your loved ones, please bring those questions to a medical professional, uh, your sleep specialist or your narcolepsy doctor. And oh, I know what I'm forgetting. Of course, we have um, next Wednesday, the second Narcolepsy Nerd Alert series, um, and we're doing that on becoming a narcolepsy advocate. So please tune in that. It's gonna be on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so we're really excited about that new, it's more of a topic base. These broadcasts are storytelling, which is my favorite thing ever, um, but those are more topic based. So if a certain topic interests you, um, that you might wanna join us for one of those. And we're doing those monthly. Okay, uh, so with that, Brooke, you wanna go ahead and pull up your slides and um, I will introduce you. Okay, so let's see. Whoops, of course I closed out of the 
your introduction. Get that back up. So Brooke Buckley is a recent graduate from, oh shoot, how do you say the university? Duquesne. Duquesne University, where she majored in biochemistry. She was diagnosed with narcolepsy about two years ago at 22 years old. As a speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, she will share her story in hopes of helping others by bringing awareness to this often misunderstood condition. You're in for a real treat tonight, and it's my huge honor to introduce you to Brooke. So take it away. All right, thank you, Jolie. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm really excited to be here sharing my story with you guys. Um, before I start, I just want to give a huge shout out to Julie for everything that she does for Project Sleep, um, you know, and narcolepsy advocacy in general. She's just such an inspiration to me, and um, I know such an inspiration to many other people with narcolepsy as well. So thank you. And with that being said, I will um, go ahead and get started. So I was born and raised in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Um, growing up, I was very involved in lots of different uh, activities. I was a tennis player, a dancer, involved in chemistry club. Um, and it was when I was involved in chemistry club that I was really, um, I really discovered my passion for science. One of my favorite memories from growing up is going to the beach every year with my family, my parents, older sister and grandparents down in Delaware. So the picture on the left is me when I was little and my nickname was Hollywood because I always had on a new pair of sunglasses in every picture. And the bottom left picture is um, my older sister and I with my grandparents at one of our favorite restaurants down at the beach. Um, as far as other extracurricular activities, one of my favorite things to do was also country line dancing. Um, are there any other country line dancers out there? Um, growing up in Hamburg, I just, kind of always thought that that was the normal fun thing to do on a Thursday night. But then I moved to Pittsburgh and I told people that and they kind of thought it was a little bit different. Um, so I also have a cat, um, I'm a huge animal lover. My sister and I, in the picture on the bottom, um, we're doing our annual Christmas photo shoot that we do with the cat every year. Um, I do not know how we get that beard and hat to stay on his head, but he deals with it. Um, to the right of that, I have a tennis picture from uh, my senior year from the state semifinals. And to the right of that uh, is a picture from when I was Hamburg's, I was selected to be Hamburg's outstanding young woman. Um, but going back to um, me discovering my passion for science, I decided to pursue a six year doctor of pharmacy degree at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. So the top middle picture is a family photo taken on a trip out to visit Pittsburgh. One thing that my family always thought was a funny quirk of mine was that I could fall asleep anywhere, whether it was in the car, in the pool, on the beach. It was something that no one else really did, but I didn't really think anything of it just because I thought that it was normal for me. Um, but when I got to college, the sleepiness started getting a lot worse. Um, so the way that Duquesne's program works is the first two years are your pre-professional years in pharmacy school, and then your third year is your first professional year of pharmacy school. So the picture on the left is me with my family, and that was at my white coat ceremony um, at the beginning of the third year, so the first professional year of pharmacy school. And that was just to signify like your entry into the professional phase. Um, but because the workload was so significant, I felt like I was just always tired all the time. But again, I just thought that it was something that was typical for everyone. I was just another exhausted pharmacy student trying to keep my head above water. I was over caffeinated because I was drinking so much coffee. So I was having a caffeine crash. That's just everything that I thought was going on. Um, but in my third year of school at Duquesne, I had to take a pharmaceutics class and I was very interested in this class because it was the first class in pharmacy school that really dove deep into drug mechanisms and treatments. And it was also the class that everyone said was going to be the hardest that year. So I was really motivated to do well and I tried my best to pay attention. Um, and I remember one time walking into class with my large Starbucks iced coffee and I sat down and as the professor began to lecture, I just felt this wave of exhaustion come over me. 
My head started falling and I slowly became disconnected from the class. When I snapped out of it, I don't even know how much longer it was that I snapped out of it. I looked down at my notes that had become complete chicken scratch and they read, looks like hot dogs. And I thought to myself, what? Was I dreaming about hot dogs? Was he lecturing about a molecule that looked like a hot dog? I really didn't know what to think of that situation. So I excused myself to the restroom and I started pinching myself, hitting myself, doing everything that I could to try to snap out of it, wake up, make sense of what happened and go back to class. Finally, I splashed some water on my face and I went back to class and I sat down and a couple minutes later, I just felt the second wave of complete exhaustion come over me again. And it was kind of like I was drowning in the ocean trying to come up for air, but I couldn't keep my head above water with the waves that were continuously crashing over me. So I couldn't do anything about it. And the next thing that I know, my classmates were packing up and stepping over me to leave because class was over. I looked down at my arms and I had red nail marks all over my arms from trying to pinch myself, trying to stay awake. And I didn't even know that I was doing it. But I also looked down at my legs and I had red marks from hitting my legs, trying to stay awake. And the last thing that I remember the professor saying before I left was, it looks like some people need to pay more attention in this class or else it's going to reflect. Was that comment directed at me? Was that just generally speaking? I didn't know, but I felt embarrassed. I felt unintelligent. I felt like a failure. I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. And I also didn't wanna be a disappointment. And as if falling asleep in class and not being able to stay alert during the day wasn't kind of like a big enough issue in itself, I then started experiencing um, intense episodes of deja vu. For example, I would be talking to someone mid-conversation and I would reference something that I thought they had said. And they would look at me and just kind of be confused. And I was like, yeah, you know, that thing that you just said. Um, and turns out they had never said it. So what happened was I was kind of experiencing like these mini sleeps when I was having conversations with people. So it was like I was awake, but also dreaming at the same time. Um, another example is there was a time where I had a dream at night that I simply took a shower. That was it. That was the dream. Um, but then later on in the day, I actually could not remember if I had taken a shower just because the dream was so clear. So it was kind of like my dreams and reality were blurring together and I couldn't really distinguish between the two. Um, and sometimes that kind of put me in a dangerous situation. Um, there was one time where I was napping in my apartment before dinner and I was having a dream that there was this alarm going off and it was almost like I became conscious inside my dream that there was an alarm, I needed to wake up, but I couldn't. So I don't know how much time passed, but when I did wake up, the fire alarm in my apartment building was actually going off. And I thought to myself, this is pretty scary because I just slept through a fire alarm, but you know, it's probably just someone burning popcorn again. This happens all the time in this building. Um, but then I heard footsteps running on the floor above mine and I got out of bed to investigate. I was immediately hit with a cloud of smoke as I opened the door because my neighbor's apartment was actually on fire. So I panicked and I started rushing down seven flights of stairs and I was scared because it seemed to me that I was the last one that had evacuated from my floor. So I was wondering, would anyone have come to check if you know, everyone was out of their apartment? Um, so it was really scary, but I was lucky that the situation wasn't worse. Um, and then also, Around when I was 21 years old, I also began experiencing uh, frightening episodes during the night. Uh, so there was one time I was sleeping and I woke up to this weird sensation of feeling like I was being pulled out of my physical body. And it was like, I was aware that it was happening, 
but I wasn't sure if I was dreaming and I couldn't move. I remember feeling like I was being turned around and I was watching myself sleep and it was terrifying. I didn't know if I was having a bad dream. Was this some kind of weird out of body experience? Um, the next thing that I remember is waking up in the morning, not really sure what happened. Maybe it was a bad dream, um, but I told my friends about it and the friends that I was hanging out with at the time, um, they just kind of laughed at me and they were just like, you're something else. It was just a bad dream. Um, and maybe it was, but the way that they reacted kind of made me feel a little bit um, unheard. Like it wasn't something serious enough to talk about or be concerned about. Um, and so it kind of made me feel like I was going crazy in a way. Um, so I finally decided to see my family doctor after my symptoms began drastically interfering with my ability to um, stay alert during the day. And they were also affecting my mental health as well. Um, so this was mainly after I began experiencing the excessive daytime sleepiness episodes around when I was 20 years old or so. And my doctor took my concerns seriously, but at the same time, he kind of just said what I always thought, you know, I'm young and healthy otherwise, so maybe I just need to try getting more sleep, um, having a better schedule, drinking water, exercising, you know, all that stuff. Um, but he did test my thyroid and vitamin D levels. The vitamin D came back low and I was given a supplement to help with that. So that's what he had thought that it was originally. Um, but after a couple of weeks, I didn't see too much of a difference with that. I was still kind of having the same struggles um, with being able to stay alert during the day. And so I went back and it was then that I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I was given a medication to help with that. And again, I was told to wait six to eight weeks to see if the medicine would kind of like take its full effect and work. Um, but unfortunately, it did nothing for my energy levels. So again, I had to travel back and I was then given another medication to try for the same thing. And that was supposed to help increase my energy levels and boost my mood. And the same thing, again, I was told to wait six to eight weeks and I did not see a difference at all. So again, back to the doctor. And it was then that I was diagnosed with ADHD and I was given a medication for that. And that one worked for about 20 minutes. And then I was falling asleep again. So something that should have had an all day effect on me lasted about 20 minutes and then I was sleeping again. Um, and this was kind of frustrating because my family doctor was still in Hamburg and I was in Pittsburgh. So I was traveling four and a half hours each way every time I needed to go back to the doctor. Um, so it was frustrating because I was also trying to balance school, but also having a social life as well. Um, so the picture on the left here is my friends and I for my friend's 21st birthday. And then the picture on the right is my boyfriend, Sean and I at a Parmalee concert. Um, they're a country band. Um, and Sean has been in the picture ever since my, um, my symptoms started getting um, worse, I guess, and interfering more with my daily life. So he's kind of been with me throughout this whole journey. Um, so, you know, on the outside, it's like, I was having fun. I was just like a normal young adult. And, um, but you know, what wasn't seen on my Instagram was what was going on behind the scenes. Um, what I was feeling on the inside. And it's something that wasn't visible to anyone else simply because I didn't talk about it. So um, it was frustrating having to deal with um, the feeling of isolation, of feeling um, like I was dealing with something that no one else really understood. It was also frustrating, you know, during this whole journey, having to go back and forth, trying to figure out what was going on. Meanwhile, still trying to um, balance school. And picture in the middle is the glorious Pennsylvania Turnpike that I spent a lot of time on throughout this whole journey.
Um, but I remember when my family doctor looked at me and he said, I really don't know what else to tell you. And I felt unheard. I felt like my symptoms weren't serious enough because they weren't visible to anyone. I felt like everyone was just saying that it's normal to just be tired. Um, and at the same time, it kind of uh, was contradicting what I had learned in school at the time because you, know, you think as healthcare professionals, you're taught to always look at the whole patient, never give up on the patient. And it's not necessarily that he was giving up. It was just that that's not something that I would have expected to hear coming from a doctor. Um, but it was around the time that I started experiencing the nighttime episodes around when I was 21 years old. Um, so I then opened up to him about that. And it was at that point when he finally suggested seeing a sleep physician. So after waiting to get an initial consultation and get a sleep study scheduled, um, that took a little bit of time. Uh, but finally, I went into the lab for my overnight sleep study, followed by the daytime nap test that I had to take. And I waited a few more weeks for results. But overall, I remember um, dealing with symptoms uh, of sleepiness since the beginning of high school, going back to when I talked about how my friends and family thought that it was just a special quirk that I had. Um, but it took about five years or so for me to realize that something actually needed to be done about it. And um, after that, it was probably an additional two years or so um, to make any progress after being misdiagnosed multiple times. So overall, it was about seven years until I received an accurate diagnosis. I was 22 years old when I finally received my narcolepsy diagnosis. And the thought crossed my mind before, but it's not something that, um, you know, I kind of just dismissed the idea because I had always thought that narcolepsy was almost too rare to have. And it's not something that I thought would happen to me. Um, but after I was referred to the sleep physician, it uh, started to become a little bit more real. So I wasn't too surprised at that point, but I was still a little bit in shock that it was a big adjustment that I was going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. Um, but I remember when my sleep physician finally said, your sleep study was positive for narcolepsy. And I felt relieved. I finally had answers. This was a huge weight taken off my shoulders. I finally knew what was going on. Um, so my initial reaction was that I was relieved, but at the same time, I was surprised kind of because like I said before, I almost thought that it was too rare to actually have because that's not something that I heard about often. Um, so my only knowledge of narcolepsy was from comedic movies and shows. And so I didn't really relate my experience to this term, but I was actually surprised to learn that narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. And it affects one in 2,000 people. So that's 200,000 Americans and 3 million people worldwide. The symptoms vary by person, but they may include Excessive daytime sleepiness, which is periods of extreme sleepiness during the day that feel comparable to how someone without narcolepsy would feel after staying awake for 48 to 72 hours. Um, when I described my experience during my pharmaceutics lecture, that was an example of excessive daytime sleepiness. Cataplexy is striking sudden episodes of muscle weakness, usually triggered by emotions such as laughter, exhilaration, surprise, or anger. And the severity may vary from slackening of the jaw or buckling of the knees to falling down. The duration may be for a few seconds to several minutes and the person remains fully conscious during the episode, even if they're unable to speak. While everyone's experience with this symptom is unique and different, I personally do not experience cataplexy. Hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations are visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up. And these can be very frightening and confusing. And sleep paralysis is the inability to move for a few seconds or minutes upon falling asleep or waking up. And it is often accompanied by hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. It's important to know that people without narcolepsy can experience these hallucinations and sleep paralysis. 
And in fact, about one third of all people experience these at some point in their lives, uh, usually during periods of high stress or poor sleep. Uh, but for people with narcolepsy, these are much more frequent and consistent over time. So when I described the terrifying experience that I had of being pulled out of my body one night and not being able to move, that was an example of a hallucination accompanied by sleep paralysis. Um, disrupted nighttime sleep is another symptom of narcolepsy. And unlike public perceptions, people with narcolepsy do not actually sleep all the time, uh, but rather the timing of sleepiness is off. With narcolepsy, so one may fight sleepiness during the day, but struggle to sleep at night. There are two forms of narcolepsy, narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy. And recent research suggests that narcolepsy with cataplexy is caused by a lack of hypocretin, which is a key neurotransmitter that helps sustain alertness and regulate the sleep-wake cycle. And less is known about narcolepsy without cataplexy. My diagnosis is narcolepsy without cataplexy. Diagnosis typically includes a 24-hour sleep study that includes a nighttime portion called a polysomnogram and a daytime nap portion called a multiple sleep latency test to record one's brain waves. And the diagnosis is mainly based on how quickly and frequently one goes into rapid eye movement or dream sleep uh, stage during these tests. Picture on this slide is me when I had my sleep study done. And the best part about it was when they hooked me up to all the wires and then they said, now just sleep normally. Uh, there's currently no cure for narcolepsy. Um, but treatment for symptom management varies widely by person and may include uh, wake promoting histamine directed or stimulant medications to increase alertness in the daytime, nighttime medications to increase wakefulness and reduce cataplexy, uh, antidepressant medication to decrease occurrence of cataplexy, and scheduled daytime naps. Coping strategies vary widely by person, but they may include social support, such as meetup groups or social media, and improvement in general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. Um, even after my diagnosis, finding the right medication for me was still a struggle since everyone's narcolepsy journey is different. Um, but personally, I tried one type of stimulant and one nighttime medication first, and they were unsuccessful for me, um, which was frustrating at times when treatment was an experiment. Uh, I then tried two different wake promoting agents and they have been successful for me. Um, in addition to medication, I also take short naps when I need to and also make other lifestyle adjustments. I try to um, take care of my sleep hygiene, have a routine and exercise. Um, but since it's only been a little under two years since my diagnosis, I'm still kind of trying to figure things out. I don't think that anyone has it all figured out. It is a journey, um, but it has been helpful trying to have a positive mindset and taking time to do things I enjoy. Um, so support groups have been very helpful for me. Um, it's nice to know that people are going through the same thing that I am. Um, so one thing that's really helpful for me is uh, Facebook support groups. So, you know, just a basic Facebook search of like narcolepsy support groups. Um, and it's nice because people talk so openly and honestly, and you don't have to worry about um, hiding anything or being afraid of who you are. Um, and then also uh, Narcolepsy Network does a support group on Thursdays. That's like a virtual support group where you can actually come in on the Zoom call and see everyone's faces and just talk and have a conversation. So it's really nice to know that people are out there that understand and I'm not the only one. I don't have to feel alone. Um, so having a proper diagnosis is a relief, um, even though every day is a new adventure, um, but having the diagnosis does provide me with peace. So for now, I have decided to shift my academic path from what I originally had planned. I switched my studies to biochemistry, which was the best thing for me to do at the time because um, you know, I had to kind of go at my own pace. I had to make the necessary adjustments to make sure that I was successful in my schoolwork. Um, and I also found that I really enjoy the behind the scenes kind of part of drug uh, discovery and development. So, um, you know, I, I really found an interest in that. And it was actually kind of cool because whenever I was 
experimenting with all the different medications, I would actually be learning about, for example, histamine uh, directed uh, agents, you know, in school. So it was kind of cool to see that I was actually being prescribed something and then learning about it in school. So that was pretty neat. Um, but I did just finish my degree in biochem. So I'm happy to have accomplished that goal. And sometimes I still feel like I struggle with judging my limits, but I know that the necessary adjustments that I do have to make are um, so important to my health and well-being. Um, but my professors in school were, and when I switched over to biochemistry, um, they were very, very helpful, um, always wanting to do the best that they could to accommodate my needs, very open to discussion, very just very patient and understanding. So that was very helpful. Um, and then also my family and a few good friends have been very supportive throughout this journey. Um, I always try to surround myself with people that I know are gonna lift me up and not bring me down. Um, so also Sean, as I mentioned, my boyfriend has been very supportive. Um, as I mentioned before, he has been with me ever since the, my symptoms started getting uh, worse. And then throughout this whole journey, um, and I appreciate the fact that he's very patient. Um, for example, we could be hanging out and I will need to take a nap. And I'm like, Sean, I need to take a nap because if I don't, I'm not gonna feel good and you're not gonna be happy. So it's in everyone's best interest to just let me take this nap that I need. Um, so I included a nice picture of us on the left. And then of course I had to include my favorite picture of us on the right. From a Halloween party, we dressed up as Flame and Hot Cheeto and Chester Cheetah. So, if there's one thing that a lot of people know about me, it's that I love Flame and Hot Cheetos. So, naturally, we had to dress up like that for our Halloween costume. So, that was a lot of fun. Um, we made our own costumes. So, that was fun too. Um, and then the picture in the middle was um, my family and I on New Year's Eve. So uh, it's a tradition in my family to wear Grinch attire on New Year's Eve. Um, so that's the, the inside joke behind that picture. Uh, but I'm so very thankful for all the support that they've given me. They're willing to do anything to accommodate my needs and my lifestyle changes and you know just be there for me and make sure that I'm comfortable with being myself, that I don't have to feel like I need to hide anything um, and they want to understand this condition that is so often misunderstood. So shout out to them. Um, but other than that, I've also learned how to portion my energy based on my limits. Uh, so for example, I started um, keeping track of my energy levels. So um, trends of tracking my energy. Uh, so what I'll do is I will document what time I went to bed and what time I woke up and if I had restful sleep or not. Um, so for example, when I was in school and I had a different schedule every day that kind of varied, but now that I'm done with school and I'm job searching, um, I found that if I have restful sleep, if I go to bed at this time, wake up at this time, I'm usually most productive between the hours of nine and one. Um, but if I don't have restful sleep, then that time could be pushed back. So it just depends. Um, but I try to plan out my most demanding task for the day uh, for during those times where I know that I'm going to be most productive based on those trends. Um, also, it's been very helpful listening to uh, Mindset and Positivity podcasts. One of my favorite podcasts to listen to is The Mindset Mentor, and that's hosted by Rob Dial. Um, I like his podcast episodes because they're very short, sweet, to the point. They're like 15 minutes long, and that's just something that is good for me to listen to because it's the perfect length for the attention span that I have. Um, and he has a lot of really good advice um, in his episodes. His audience is mainly just the general public that want to improve their mindset, like better themselves, work on themselves. Um, but the energy tracking thing is actually something that I got from one of his podcasts. So that worked out in my favor because it's beneficial to my life with narcolepsy. Um, so also, if anyone has any other suggestions for podcasts, I would love to hear them because I'm always looking for recommendations. Um, so at first, I was shy about sharing my diagnosis because I was afraid of how 
some people would react. Um, I was afraid I was going to be misunderstood or not taken seriously. And I still get mixed reactions. Um, one person said, I wish I could sleep like that all the time like you do. One person said, I'm tired too all the time. It's normal to be that tired. One person said that I must be lucky to have narcolepsy. So I feel like People judge me for making the necessary adjustments because they think that narcolepsy isn't something that's serious enough. Um, it's not a serious enough condition. It's just still that funny quirk that I have where I'm always tired all the time. And some people just think that I'm lazy. So I wish that they would respond with empathy and not just assume that narcolepsy is just being tired. Um, I also remember recently confiding in someone for help about something, and I mentioned my diagnosis, and uh, they said, you look fine. What are you talking about? So that was very frustrating to me, um, but living with narcolepsy as a student was especially difficult because people would also say things like, stop making excuses and uh, take responsibility for your success and things like that. So I wish people would be more open to learning and asking questions about how narcolepsy really affects me. And not just in the way that's like, hey, how are you today? Like, how are you doing really? I think that's something that people with narcolepsy would like to hear from their supporters. Um, and I think it's important to stress that just because someone struggles don't seem as severe as someone else's from the outside, that doesn't mean they're not valid. And one of my favorite quotes is, um, just because someone carries it well, doesn't mean it's not heavy. So I'm grateful for the hope that diagnosis has given me, um, but I do just want people to understand that narcolepsy isn't just taking a nap and feeling better. Like I mentioned before, it is a journey um, and it's a continuous journey. Uh, for example, recently I've been having, for me personally, I've been having a lot of trouble staying asleep during the night now, um, which is something that I've been dealing with recently. And that's not something that I really had too, too much of an issue with before consistently. Um, so that just kind of goes to show that it is something that's a lifelong um, challenge and journey. And you just, you have to, um, you know, adapt to things like that that can be kind of thrown your way unexpectedly. Um, so having to make adjustments can be frustrating as I'm always learning for myself and having, um, you know, learning what I can handle and what I can't, um, how to properly care for my health and make sure that I'm doing everything I can to be successful, um, you know, with my health and this, this journey that I'm on. Um, but for example, one time recently, uh, I was on a camping trip and after getting back from a hike, everyone kind of just gathered around the fire, uh, started making burgers and hot dogs around the fire, and I had to slip away and take a nap for like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I didn't want to feel like I was, I didn't want to seem like I was being rude or antisocial, but at the same time, I knew this was what was best for me, and I knew that that nap was extremely vital for um, the mood that I was going to be in for the rest of the night. If I didn't take that nap, I don't know, you know, what I, I probably would have been very grumpy the rest of the day. It's just something that I needed to do to make sure that I could kind of carry on for the rest of the day. So, um, narcolepsy has taught me a lot about self-discipline, but also, um, also how to have confidence. So I'm grateful to finally be able to look at myself in the mirror and say, this is me. Um, one of my favorite movies is The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman. Um, if you've seen the movie, you know the song, This Is Me. If you haven't seen the movie, um, I encourage you to look up the song because it's very empowering. Uh, it's basically about not being afraid of who you are, going out in the world with confidence. You're not afraid to be seen. You don't have to apologize to anyone for who you are. So that's just something that I've kind of live my life by. Ever since I saw that movie, I'm like, this is me. So living with narcolepsy is not going to stop me from following my dreams. I still plan to have 
uh, future in the sciences, like I always plan to. Um, I had to include a picture down at the bottom left from my virtual graduation. Um, so that's my parents and I, and my sister is on the phone in the middle of us. So she's in Spain right now. Um, so we had to do a little virtual family photo. Um, but again, I'm just so happy that they're so supportive of me. And, um, you know, I'm proud to have accomplished that goal. And I'm learning to use narcolepsy as a superpower, not a setback. Um, I also view it as a reason to have an influence and bring awareness to others. And I want to be the reason that someone uh, looks at me and says, she did it, I can do it too. Uh, one of my other favorite quotes is to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. And I'm honestly not sure who said that, but that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, so I try to celebrate little triumphs and appreciate the things that I can do now that I have an accurate diagnosis. And I can share my story in hopes of uh, bringing awareness and helping others and especially college students that are going through the same thing. Um, but I feel proud of myself when I can accomplish something as simple as even just cleaning my apartment or throwing in a load of laundry without uh, feeling like I need to say, I don't have the strength to do this right now, or I'll just wait until tomorrow and things like that. I remember one time my senior year of high school, I was playing a very challenging tennis match um, and it was a tiebreaker. And one of my teammates yelled out, you got this. And my coach stopped them and he was like, no, you don't have anything in tennis. You don't have anything in life. Nothing is guaranteed. How about we say you can do this? And it was that mindset that got our team all the way to state semifinals that year. So ever since the day of my diagnosis, I kind of just looked at life with the mindset of you can do this. I can do this. Um, I can do this knowing that I have the strength, the courage, and the willpower to face what life threw my way. In addition, I also got a dog that I'm training to eventually be my service dog. Her name is Athena, and as you can see, she is quite a goof. Um, I always say that the picture on the right would be her Facebook profile picture if she had Facebook. Um, but by the way, if anyone also has a service dog, please feel free to comment because I would love to connect with other people that have service dogs. Um, and I would love to follow your adventures on social media. Um, but Athena is going to be trained to um, alert to loud noises such as the fire alarm um, and also um, recognize behaviors that kind of show that I'm getting sleepy during the day, for example, like. I'll tap my foot if I start to get tired and I'm trying to like keep myself awake or I start like head bobbing or like kind of just hitting myself, trying to keep myself awake and she'll alert to that and she'll basically kind of say in her way, hey, you need to go lay down, like find a safe place where you can lay down and just take a break. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited uh, to be training her. She's, she's a goofball, um, but because of low awareness, even among physicians and misperceptions, there's an average of eight to 15 years between narcolepsy symptom onset and diagnosis. It's estimated that the majority of people with narcolepsy are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Common misdiagnoses include epilepsy, depression, and schizophrenia. So overall, it was about five years until I started seeing a doctor for my symptoms, and I was then misdiagnosed for period of about two years. Uh, so this adds to a total of seven years before receiving a proper diagnosis for me personally. It's important to note that narcolepsy and other sleep disorders affect more people than we think because it's not something that many people think of. It is an invisible thing. So by stressing the importance of getting um, an early diagnosis, people living with narcolepsy can have a better quality of life by getting the right treatment at the right time. And I also want everyone to know that in a world that's so stimulated and, you know, where everyone has the hustle mindset and everyone's like, go, 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 there needs to be an emphasis on rest because resting today will help you live the life that you want to live tomorrow. So I'm sharing my story today as a part of the Rising Voices of Narcolepsy, a program of the nonprofit organization Project Sleep. Uh, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of narcolepsy. 
So thank you for listening to my story and I will be happy to answer any questions. Yay, Brooke. I'm clapping on behalf of many other people that are tuning in. So I got to clap louder. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, well, you have me in tears, my dear, <laughs> the good kind. Oh. Um, but uh, thank you for uh, so eloquently sharing so many amazing points. Uh, like it's hard to even keep track of all the amazing things you were saying. They were like one after another. I was like, oh, that point. Oh, that point. Um, so um, let's see. I'm going to ask you a few questions and folks, please send in your questions. We are getting a few questions coming in. Um, shout out to people that are listening. I have people tuned in from Michigan, Alabama, Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, and I'm sure other places as well, uh, because there's more people than just that. Uh, so thank you guys for, uh, and California, did I say Cal I didn't say California. We definitely have more than me in California, Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Uh, so yes, um, my first question for you is just a little bit about accommodations. You did mention that your, profess your professors were really understanding. Um, did you go through the official uh, like disability services office at your school or did you just approach them individually or how did you approach that? Yeah, so um, at my school, we did have the office of um, freshman services and disabilities. Um, so I went through them. Um, my doctor wrote a note to them basically saying like, these are the recommended accommodations for her based on her symptoms. And she didn't say, like, they didn't require um, obviously like for the doctor to disclose what the diagnosis was. Um, but we, I met with the guy that was in charge of it and we kind of just went over like reasonable accommodations, you know, like um, for example, longer, like a longer time period to test, um, uh, handing in assignments a little bit late. Um, if I would miss class because I overslept, um, I would get a recording or notes. Um, so a lot of people I feel like um, don't really discuss what their diagnosis is with their professors, uh, but the guy that was in charge of the disability services at school he suggested that maybe it would be in my best interest to kind of just let my professors know what's going on so that they could be a little bit more understanding and kind of just, you know, really accommodate what I personally need. So that is something that I did. I went through the, um, the office and then I also approached them on the side and I was like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I need. And they were very understanding. That's awesome. Um... It's always good to hear good stories. <laughs> They're not always um, great stories with accommodations. Um, how did you decide what you were going to ask for? Was it somewhat of a back and forth of, um, you know, the man that you met with, was he familiar with narcolepsy or, um, you know, how did you come up with those ideas? Yeah, actually, um, the man that I met with did not ever meet anyone with narcolepsy. Um, so that was why he kind of suggested and maybe I should just have that talk with my professors so they can kind of just get a better understanding. Um, but it was part of what my doctor suggested, like, okay, maybe you need to request more time on a test and stuff like that. Um, and then the guy from the disability services also suggested like accommodations that other people have requested just for other things, uh, such as like if I would have to miss class for a doctor's appointment, or in my case, because I would oversleep, um, getting notes or getting a recording. Um, so it was kind of a combination of my doctor suggesting things and then him suggesting things as well, me kind of throwing out ideas and then also just individually talking to the professors. And they're like, if you need more time on this assignment, let me know, I will give you an extension. So that was really nice. That's really great to hear. Yeah. Very, very inspiring. Well, there's good people out there, folks. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, we have some questions about your your service dog, Athena. Athena is a, a goddess of something, right? Wisdom of war. Of war? Well, in Greek mythology. Is that how she got her name? Um, well, I just always thought that Athena was a really cool name for a German Shepherd. So that's like something that I kind of always wanted to name a dog. 
And then it was funny because Sean also thought that it was a really cool name for a dog. So we're like, this is perfect. We're going to name her Athena. Very cool. Oh, oh yeah. Shout out to Sean who's listening. Hi, Sean. Thank you for being awesome partner. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so someone also tuned in and said they are listening from Arkansas. So shout out to Arkansas as well. Uh, so uh, Lisa was asking if, if other people had service dogs for narcolepsy. And I believe so. I think it's a growing uh, group of people. I can think of uh, at three or four off of just like the top of my mind of people I know. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many more. Um, so how did, you know, how did you get that idea? And um, I think it wasn't always part of your treatment from the beginning, right? How did you decide to add Athena? So it was mainly after the incident with the fire alarm and the fact that I slept through the fire alarm. Um, I brought that up to my doctor and she was like, that is very concerning uh, for your safety. Cause I lived with a roommate um, back when I lived downtown, but at that time my roommate wasn't home. So, you know, it was just, uh, now I live with Sean and he travels for work sometimes. So it's like, if I'm ever here by myself and something happens, I don't wake up, you know, having a service dog that would be able to alert me to loud noises, alarms, fire alarms, um, you know, that would be the best thing for my safety. Uh, so I started looking into that a little bit um, after talking to the doctor and I found a lot of really good resources. I also joined like a lot of Facebook groups like service dogs for narcolepsy and um, service dogs for uh, invisible disabilities, I think. And it was nice to see like how many other people had service dogs for invisible disabilities. Um, so in the service dogs for narcolepsy group, one of the things that they were saying was like, um, you know, kind of alerting you to certain behaviors that you're getting ready to fall asleep and just kind of letting you know, hey, you need to go lay down somewhere safe. So. That sounds amazing. I could really use that. <laughs> it's like, I mean, sometimes that's something like I know, but um, I don't quite do anything about it. <laughs> right. So yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Okay, we have a question from Beverly. Hi, Beverly. Um, Beverly says, uh, what kept you from giving up when the first and second round of drugs didn't help? My son has been given two different uh, drugs and neither helps. Uh, seems to make it worse. Uh, now he doesn't want to try another one. How can I help him? Hmm. And that's, that's a really good question because that's what is tough about the road to diagnosis. I know for a lot of people, it is trial and error, um, being misdiagnosed. Um, I guess the reason why I didn't just give up was because the way that my personal experience went, it was like I was experiencing the daytime sleepiness. Um, you know, the medication didn't help for that, the antidepressants that I was given. Um, but it was then when I started having the nighttime episodes, um, and it was when I expressed that part of it to my doctor um, that he finally said, you should probably see a sleep physician. So I think for me personally, it was kind of the progression of symptoms, um, but that's just me. Uh, so that's why I felt like there was still hope to get an accurate diagnosis um, because I, I knew that something wasn't right also, whenever I was given the medication for the ADHD, and it should have been an all-day effect, and it worked for 20 minutes, that's when I, I kind of really knew that something was wrong after that. Um, so that's just how it went for me. And um, we talked about this when we uh, prepared. We had a little prep session. I think it's so interesting of having how you have this uh, pharmaceutical um, studies, I, I'm not, I don't know if that's the correct name, but that background uh, from when you started your degree. Um, and so, you know, did you get a sense when you were studying that, that uh, patients really do have this journey of finding the right medication? So once you're diagnosed, even that the first treatment might, might not be the right one, did you get that sense uh, from how you learned about this in school? Mm -hmm. Well, in school, they didn't really talk about narcolepsy when I was studying. Um, but just generally speaking, uh, a lot of times patients would, you know, go back, ask a doctor, ask the pharmacist, like this medicine isn't working, what can I do next? And a lot of times we were kind of taught like, um, this medicine's for this, this medicine's for this. And so I feel like we didn't really talk too, too much about how 
every patient is different in the sense that like something might not work for someone the way it does for someone else. So I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really think about it that way um, prior to us talking about it before, but yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's such a hard part of the experience is because I think we want to feel better right away. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I just add Beverly, you know, not that we can, I, everyone's on their own path and I must be very challenging to be a mother and want your son to do something and maybe he doesn't want to do, but the good, I think there is a lot of drug development that's happening. And so, um, you know, newer treatments are coming out. And so there's new options, uh, that could be different. Um, and just trying to think of it as information gathering <laughs> to try to try some different ones and, and see what might help. But um, certainly know that it must be challenging to be a mother and trying to uh, bring your son along on a journey when he is also on his own journey. So, uh, and it is frustrating, you know, dealing with, like I was saying about how, you know, the medicines would take six to eight weeks to take their full effect and then it didn't work. It is frustrating and it is, it is a long journey. Um, but, um, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, like Julie said, a lot of, you know, new drug discovery, more options coming out. So. Okay. Let's see. We have a, more questions. Uh, let's see. Lots of comments, lots of great comments. Uh, what's it like looking for a job knowing you might have to ask for accommodations? That is a great question. Um, so the way that I'm kind of going about it is I would only ask for accommodations after I get hired. Um, that's actually something that people were talking about in one of the support groups. They were asking the question of like, do you go into a job interview kind of like saying, this is what's going on, this is what I'm going to need, or do you get the job and then ask for accommodations? Um, so I kind of agreed with the idea that I would get hired and then ask for accommodations. And, you know, I feel like if they're, if the accommodations are within reason, I've, I've heard of people like uh, my doctor actually just talked about this the other day, um, scheduling like uh, 20 minute nap sessions, like once a day, um, that would be a reasonable accommodation. And I don't think if this was a while ago, like at the beginning of when I was diagnosed, I might be a little bit more nervous about it. But I think at this point, I've just accepted that that's who I am and that's what's gonna be what's best for me. So I feel like I shouldn't really be that nervous asking for accommodations because I know that it's gonna help me perform the best at my job. Yeah, and there's certainly you know, one, there's certainly no one right way. And I, I would probably go um, with what, you described, which was my dad's advice. My dad was an employment lawyer um, and he said to create some good rapport um, uh, on a job for a little while, as much as you can, um, before disclosing and talking about accommodations. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's, you know, basically, and his other point was to definitely tell them though, and don't let your performance get too bad. <laughs> right. Uh, you uh, bring it up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like that's something you kind of want to establish early on. Um, so that way you don't ask for accommodations kind of like in retrospect after you're already like your, your diagnosis is affecting your performance and they don't know what's going on. So I think that it's something to, you know, ask for sooner rather than later. So yeah. It was, I mean, interesting for me because when I was looking for a job, I had already published a book about my experience. So it certainly wasn't, um, you know, hidden or people didn't, people knew, but I, my experience was that the person that finally hired me for a full-time job, my first full-time job, um, she knew I had narcolepsy, but I realized way later, she didn't know what that actually meant. You know, um, that she didn't have, she knew I had it, but there was no sense that it was going to any, but until I finally brought it up, which actually took a whole big thing of telling my coworker and my coworker brought it to her, you know, I mean, which is probably not right, but it, it <laughs> um, the, she just thought, oh, she has narcolepsy, but she didn't think that it was actually going to affect me. Um, and I was sneaking down to my car to take naps and eating all this sugary food and, and taking too much medicine to just try to get through the day. So, but once I did say, you know, I really just need a place to nap that's, um, 
you know, enclosed and has a bench or something and hopefully a lock on the door. Once I was very clear with what I needed, then it was much easier. Um, you know, so it is kind of interesting. I think some people think narcolepsy is so big that like you couldn't do your job and other people think it's so small that it's not going to affect you at all. Right. It's yeah. like kind of like one of the two extremes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Tiffany asks, how did, how do you get a, the dog registered? Um, so that is a good question. Um, there is a lot of gray area. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on state, but based on my understanding, um, there really is no registration for a service dog. Um, it's basically you have a disability as defined by the definition that um, you have a physical or mental impairment that um, limits your ability to perform one or more major life tasks. Um, and under that definition, um, you are, I guess, considered disabled. Um, and so your dog is trained, task trained to perform work to accommodate for your specific disability. So based on my understanding, if your dog is task trained for your disability, then it is your service dog. But again, there's a lot of technicalities that, um, you know, there's a lot of gray area with the law and state versus federal. And, um, but my understanding is that there is no like, you know, there's people that go online and buy service dog certifications, which is not legal. Um, so um, there's, there's no registration in terms of that. Um, I know that a lot of trainers do it differently though. Some trainers, if you're going through a service dog training program, they want the dog to pass their um, canine good citizen test before they could go out in public uh, for their public access and then they take a public access test and then in terms of their program they will be um, a service dog but I think it also depends too on the type of dog that it is um, like for narcolepsy it's obviously very different than it is for um, like a seeing eye dog or a diabetic alert dog, the training's very different. And I think if you go through a program, there's different requirements that they might have you do. Well said. Um, maybe we'll need to have a broadcast on this eventually. <laughs> we have so many different broadcast topics, it's hard to keep straight, but we'd like to see more cute dogs in our broadcast, right? My goodness. Um, so let's see, uh, Beverly asks uh, that it's so amazing to, that so many people don't understand or don't know what narcolepsy is. Um, I found that to be the case with the school system, doctors, even friends. What can we do to help educate society? Um, I think really, um, you know, just people with narcolepsy, you know, the rising voices is a great uh, example, um, you know, just reaching out to um, places like schools and doctor's offices and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's really important to start local within your community um, because I feel like you kind of establish like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You kind of establish, you have a good connection with people I feel like when you're in a small local area versus trying to go too big too soon. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, just and like I said, Rising Voices is a perfect example, but I think just reaching out and spreading awareness to those places on social media, like those are all great things, so. Yes, um, we had a tagline for World Narcolepsy Day that global starts with local, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we all, I, I, I don't know, I'm super impatient. I'd like to change the awareness um, overnight. Um, but uh, the longer I'm in the field, the more you realize change is slow. But I do think that we are making great progress through storytelling um, and other approaches, uh, sharing on social media and uh, some of the different international collaborations and stuff like that. So there, it's, there's hope, I think. <laughs> um, and we're just so grateful to people like Brooke who do this as a volunteer to become trained and going out and sharing their stories. It's a little bit different right now because of COVID, a little bit tougher to find those speaking engagements, but um, eventually we'll be <laughs> out there more in the community when things are a little bit better. Um, let's see. Uh, 
So yeah, so just a little bit more comments about the service dog. So we can check out all these comments later. I don't see any other questions right now. Um, and thank you, Jen, for your comment about your daughter. Um, there's just a lot of people really relating to your story, Brooke. Um, and you should be so, so, so proud uh, for sharing tonight. Um, you've touched my heart and I'm sure many other people. Uh, and I can't wait to listen to these podcasts. Um, I love specific recommendations. So what was the name of the podcast again? Mindset Mentor. Mindset Mentor. Okay, we're going to put that, we'll put a link to that in the uh, comments here uh, okay. and check that out. And um, yeah, I think with that, we'll go ahead and say good night. We're over an hour here and um, just can't thank you enough, Brooke. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. And if you can think of anywhere that you'd like Brooke to speak, uh, you know, Brooke could always zoom in probably to anywhere. So if you know, if you have a group of people that might like to hear her story uh, in your community, we could always set that up too, probably. So just keep us in mind and we'll just keep spreading awareness. Okay, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Stay warm. Okay. Stay safe. Thanks again, Brooke. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye.